Hi Vineet, can you hear me? It's not showing your live thing, not showing. Hi Karan, hi Manasvi, hi Riddhi, hi Tinky Didi, hi Manu, Sheetal. Can you all hear me? Am I audible folks? Perfect. I'm just waiting for uh, Tejpreet to join us. So just to give you an introduction uh, to the Purkari X COVID-19, uh, I think most of you know that we've been running these, uh, this series of talks to help people uh, get through this situation of lockdown. And today we are addressing the issue of uh, getting past the lockdown, how to open industry, what we can do to help, uh, uh, you know, industry open. Just a second. Okay, I'm still waiting for uh, Tejpreet to join us. Welcome everybody. Welcome Yuvraj, Manath, uh, Dr. Poonam, Kamaldeep, hi. Hi Rishab. Hi Vikram, Nidhi, Meeta. We're still waiting for... Uh, he has not come on. I don't see Tejpreet. Just a second, folks. Tejpreet says he's joined. Yes, Tejpreet is here. And let's add him. Where is Tejpreet? I've just added Tejpreet. Hi, Aarti. Hi, Priyanka. Indu auntie, so lovely to see you here. Hi, Anuradha. And we've got Tejpreet on. This is perfect. Hi, Tejpreet. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, you Everybody, can you hear Tejpreet? Wonderful. Okay, so let's get started. We have a ton of questions, Tejpreet, for you. It's a long, long list. So I'm going to start by introducing Tejpreet. Tejpreet is the founder and CEO of Bharat Light and Power. Uh, before this, he was uh, one of the youngest um, CEOs and president of GE of the Indian subcontinent. And uh, of course, sits on several boards, um, attends Davos, the World Economic Forum every year, uh, is a uh, young global leader, part of the Aspen Institute board, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so I'm going to stop here because we have a long, long list of uh, things, questions here. Um, TP, should we get started or do you want to say something before we start? No, happy to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me and really appreciate the kind introduction. So TP, the first question we have here is a general question, uh, which talks about uh, a recession. Every recession has seen a shift in economic power. Uh, there is talk of business moving from China to other manufacturing centers. Do you see India taking advantage of the situation and emerging as a powerhouse? First of all, thanks so much, Praneet, and thanks for that great question. I think the COVID-19 is going to be a fundamental shift in the way business is done and the world economy. If you just take a step back, $18 trillion of wealth and, and of, and of uh, GDP is going to get wiped out around the world. And if you just think about the quantum of capital that has been put in by the United States, England, etc., it's roughly about $8 trillion. So $10 trillion of capital is going to get wiped out, and that's going to cause a huge negative impact on the global economy. On India itself, if you think about it, we are a $3 trillion economy, of which about $1 trillion is going to get wiped out. So the economic damage that this coronavirus is going to cause on the global economy is going to be unprecedented, unlike anything we've ever seen. Now, therefore, do you see a, a shift in economic parts? I think that's going to be, a, that's a very, very interesting question. There is no doubt there's going to create, this whole corona is causing an incredible economic imbalance and a geopolitical imbalance between the United States and China. I think the, China, the US government is very clear that it's going to take, do whatever it takes to get its economy back on track, whether that right now they're pumping in $5 trillion, whether they pump in more or not, I don't know, 
but they will do whatever it takes to get their economy back on track. In terms of the shift, uh, there is no doubt that the fact that the Chinese have managed controlling Corona in a very short period of time, the fact that they've been able to get their manufacturing back on track, the fact that the infrastructure and the whole economic machine is beginning to start working again, they obviously have a real head start versus the rest of the world, whether it's Europe, whether it's India or the United States. So there is no doubt that the, that the Chinese economy is becoming to get back, go way ahead of everybody else. On your specific question, whether India will be able to take advantage, I think that's a good question. I think it's our chance in the global economy to really take charge, uh, take, uh, take charge of this opportunity and make something happen uh, in order to attract this investment. I think it's an incredible time. I think a few things are against us. At the end of the day, we have to get over the whole corona situation very, very quickly to create a stable environment to attract all this investment to ensure we give a, a stable infrastructure and a, and a reliable supply chain for the global world. Let me give you a quick example. If you are a big, large manufacturing company in, in Europe today, what do you need? You need predictable supply chain from wherever in the world you're going to get your supply from. And that's a bit of a challenge today in India because, because of the challenge of the lockdown, the fact that we all our factories have had to stop, the fact that our supply chain is broken, whereas the Chinese have already started manufacturing, I think that is a little bit of a disadvantage in the short term for us. However, in the longer term, I sincerely hope we as a country can actually get everything back on track very quickly, get the country economy back, get manufacturing back on track so that we can become a good alternative for global supply chain uh, in the world economy. Thank you, Tejpri. That was uh, quite an incredible analysis. And I do hope uh, the Indian government does take, uh, take this opportunity and not pass up on this. Uh, it is a huge, uh, you know, uh, challenge for the world, especially given that the U.S. has chosen livelihood over lives. So that's going to be a tough one to compete with. You know, we have chosen lives over that. So let's see how things pan out. Uh, Tejpreet, moving to um, now what you do. Would, can you let us, tell us what you do specifically? Right. So, uh, Praneet, we are basically an enterprise AI and industrial IoT solution provider. What does that mean? Basically, in a nutshell, what we do is we go into factory floors around the world or any machine around the world. We put sensors and gateways into these machines or into the production line get the data out onto a platform, which is sort of like the cloud. And on that platform is where we write all our algorithms to actually do AI algorithms on that cloud. These algorithms take all that data that is extracted from the factory floor, analyze all that data and provide insights to customers to help customers drive outcomes. And as a result of that, what we are driving is how do we improve productivity? How do we reduce costs? And how do we drive uh, efficiencies in terms of safety and sustainability? So those are sort of the three broad macro things we're trying to achieve through developing AI algorithms in terms of what we do. Now, what is it uh, specifically right now in terms of how, is this, how does this impact the corona world? Over the last 20 days, I've had the opportunity, we are calling it in our company, uh, innovating for customers. And therefore, over the last three weeks, I've been having conversations with CEOs, CIOs, factory managers, plant managers of large companies in Europe and the US and in India, obviously, to really understand how we did business in the pre-corona period, what's it going to be like in the post-corona period, and what the new normal is. It is very clear that the new normal is going to be different. I think the way we do business the way we interact, the way we manufacture is going to completely change. Let me share a few examples. In the US, there's a huge requirement for ventilators. Now, I don't think in the history of manufacturing, any of us could have ever thought that General Motors and GE would collaborate to start actually do make, manufact make uh, ventilators in a production line that used to make cars. So here is a situation out of an emergency where companies have rewritten the way of manufacturing to be able to put up a new production line 
in, I don't know, nine, 10, 12 days to start making ventilators. Yeah. Now, the yeah. reason they've been able to do it is the following. One is that we are, I'm finding that a lot of companies are willing to collaborate and share ideas in terms of how to At change manufacturing point. and start making a way to, in order to do uh, a new way of thinking to manufacture. So I really feel that in this new way, things have changed. So what is really changing when I talk to all these CEOs is three things. One, a huge focus on productivity, whether productivity is in terms of manufacturing, whether it's in supply chain, how do we change productivity? Two, supply chain optimization. How do you change the way distribution is done across companies? And the third thing I really believe is that everybody's interaction has become more human. We are all sharing. There's collaboration happening, partnerships happening between companies that used to compete to be able to help all of us make the world a better place. So I see a lot of that happening around the world. And, if, and how what we are doing now is taking these ideas and adapting it to the kind of technologies we develop. Uh, TP, um, I'm out of the uh, development work that you're doing, is there anything that has changed in terms of uh, this COVID world? Yeah. So, Preet, what we did was about 12 days ago, a uh, couple of the largest corporations in India and some of the biggest multinationals operating in India and people who have really large workforces in India, along with a few folks in government, challenged us and said, is there a way that you can take all the AI and IoT technologies you have and adapt it to what we need in India, which is how do we help keep our workforces safe and how do we help industry get back on track? So that was the key challenge we were given about 12 days ago. Over the last 12 days, what we've challenged our team is to see if we can take all the technologies we have and adapt it to solve this particular problem in terms of how do we keep our workforce safe. So we've been working day and night and I've come up with three solutions to keep our workforce okay. safe in India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really want, I'm proud of what the team has created. The first one is a lot of the factories and in public spaces, there exist cameras. Uh, and these are normal IP cameras or analog cameras. What we have done is taken uh, the camera feed that you get from all these factories, put a layer of mathematical models and neural mm -hmm. network models to train these cameras to detect if somebody's wearing a mask, if somebody's wearing a okay. helmet, if somebody's wearing safety gear. And in addition to that, trained our models to do social distancing. So when two people come within a certain distance, it sends out an alert to the control center in the factory, or it sends out an alarm to the Hooter system or to the PA system to want people to move away. So that's number one. Wow. Number okay. two, a lot of these companies came and said that, listen, we have a challenge because in a factory, you have dark spots. You don't have cameras in the toilets. You don't have cameras in the canteen. Or also what happens is that a lot of times you have truckers who come to your factory premises or you actually have uh, uh, migrant labor who come for the loading and unloading. Also, if you're a big multinational, you have tier two, tier three suppliers who don't actually have cameras installed. So mm. is it possible to come up with low cost solutions to help keep our workforce safe? So what we've done is we've created an app. It's called Us where we have been able to mo modify cell phone technology to give people an active defense system. So it's sort of like, you know, when your car is, you're reversing your car, you get very close to the wall at the back, it starts being beep, beep, get, beep, something yeah. similar to that. So when two people get very close, your cell phones vibrate. So that's how the whole genesis started. And in addition to that, we've created an enterprise version because a mm -hmm. lot of these large corporates are saying, don't only do that, but give us more. Can we make it an attendance system? Can we actually help track people's temperature? Can we see uh, you know, where our people are? Can we drive it into a more of a productivity tool for people? So while we are rushing to get the app out to enterprises to meet at least the basic criteria needed during the corona time, on top of it, we are building a far larger application to solve other problems. And in addition, what we are thinking is maybe we give a base version for free to the public to keep them safe as well. So that's product. Oh, that two. would be incredible. Okay. And the third product we're actually thinking about is today in large warehouses, think about this. Today you use RFID and barcodes to track a box in a 20 acre warehouse. What do, yeah. we, what do we do? 
we take a small little BLE tag, which is a Bluetooth energy tag, which is as big as your shirt, uh, uh, your shirt button, button, a little bigger than a shirt button. We put that on the box. And what we have the capability of doing is tracking that box in milliseconds in a 20 acre factory, what would normally take about 10 minutes to find a box. So technically wow, I could brilliant. put my phone in a 20 acre factory and find it within 50 centimeters. So it's very, very accurate technology. So what we've done mm -hmm. is taken that same idea, taken the chip, put it into a wristband, which people wear like a Fitbit, and also embedded that chip into an ID card. So when two people get very close, it sends off an alert. But more importantly, in a post-corona world, what we can therefore do is not only drive asset productivity, but also drive people productivity in a post-corona world. Brilliant, brilliant, wow. This is something I think we all need and it's gonna be a one-stop solution for all uh, factories going ahead. Um, uh, TP, we, the next question we have for you is, um, this is from Advitya Khanna. Uh, the question that I have, he says, is to security and privacy. As in, uh, as in this product and other IoT products that enable industries to become more efficient by collecting data and making predictions in real time through machine learning, AI, how do we ensure that security and privacy of individuals and businesses are kept? More specifically, what is the tech industry doing to ensure that some malicious actors or businesses aren't able to get unfair advantages over competing businesses by engaging in nefarious activities? Pranit, that's, a, How, that's an excellent question. And I really believe cybersecurity and security in this new world <clears throat> is going to be play an absolutely critical element. And in fact, while we were developing these technologies, privacy uh, was, was a, one of the biggest uh, discussion points that we had with some of these large corporations. <clears throat> For, as, you, as you are aware, privacy is a really big concern in this new world. And therefore, what did we do? For the public version that we're thinking about is the fact that we don't want anybody's data. We don't want any information from anybody. So what we've been able to do is launch the app on a completely incognito mode where really we don't, we, we're not taking any data. We're not taking any information. All it's doing is keeping you safe by giving you active alerts in real time rather than giving it to you from a, on a passive basis. So that's what okay. we're trying to do. However, on the enterprise version, in the safe security of the four walls of your factory or in your office space where everybody knows everybody, in that environment, we have two kinds of companies. Some companies say we'd rather continue being incognito because, you know, mm -hmm. for privacy concerns. But in some companies, they feel it's a safe enough environment in your factory space where with everybody, in order to keep everybody safe within the confines of your factory environment, they are okay to get the data out in order to provide that layer of applications, to provide them analytics, to help pe keep people safe. Uh, so that's, those are the sort of the two environments, but I completely agree with Aditya that at the end of the day, security, uh, privacy are two absolutely key elements uh, going forward. I think that's gonna be a concern with anything to do with uh, AI or you know, the internet in general. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think you already mentioned about this being used by the government. Uh, has, have talks already begun? Where are you with that? Yeah, the government's come out with, a, with an excellent app, uh, you know, called Arogya Setu, but it's a little bit of a different philosophy. Uh, it's, a, it's a passive mm -hmm. system where if anybody comes, uh, uh, you know, 10 days later, I could get a message saying that, you know, I came across somebody. Uh, but the point from our perspective is we've started those, uh, we've started working and engaging with the government to sort of see if there's a way that we can deploy this as a make in India solution to keep our workforce safe in our country. Brilliant. Um, TP, while big industries can afford and uh, afford to pay uh, for the cost of such innovation, what about small retailers, family businesses? What kind of tech can they use? Uh, you know, what about old school businesses, textiles, 
these kind of uh, businesses, how can they adapt to this kind of technology? Uh, the question was posed by Mrs. Seema Kocher as well as uh, Charanjit Sopti. Yeah. Uh, we've actually designed two of the three applications, keeping costs in mind. Uh, and the fact and the reason is that we want this to be adopted widely uh, and we want as many people to benefit from this in our country to keep them safe. So that is part of the reason why uh, we are willing to actually give a free version of the application to the large country, uh, to the country in order to keep people safe. Uh, similarly, what we've also done is to keep uh, from an application perspective, keep the costs really, really low. And therefore, we, while we looked at a whole variety of technologies, uh, we've actually kept the cost low so that everybody has a cell phone in our, most people, if not all, have cell phones in our country. Yeah. So they can just easily download the app onto your phone um, okay. and, and, and start using it. Uh, the cost of the enterprise version, we've kept it very, very economical so that we do get widespread usage uh, and everybody benefits from it. Uh, we are at the moment doing the beta testing of the app. It's called Us. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And the an enterprise version is called Us Pro. Uh, and hopefully over the next few days, we will uh, formally launch the product. Tejpreet, uh, Artika from Colombo has a question here. What's the government's approach on this issue of privacy and security as far <coughs> as, the, as private enterprise are concerned? Uh, you know, it's a difficult for me to answer what the what the government's view is on this. I think it is a big issue with the government that the government has put to, in place certain protocols uh, within the platform uh, to ensure that privacy is kept. And I think if I remember right, what they are looking to do is after a certain period of time, I think it's four weeks or six weeks, within some period of time, they wipe out all the data. So okay. they have okay. taken... Uh, the necessary steps to to ensure safety uh, of of people and privacy is maintained. Uh, so I think that's what I know is as much as what everybody knows. But I do okay. I am aware of that they have gone and thought through a lot of these steps to make sure that uh, you know these factors are taken into consideration. Uh, Sachin Khanna uh, has a question: uh, What about people without smartphones? A lot of the workers, factory workers have simple uh, phones, you know, the old model phones. No, good question. I think uh, we've struggled with this, to be frank, right? And uh, at this point in time, we don't have a really good solution for, for, for that segment of the market. Uh, we are trying to do things in warp speed. We've only been at this for the last 12, 13 days. So we've been working day and night to, to develop the technology, uh, it's not easy because we're going doing something that's very, very innovative. Uh, and mm -hmm. at this point in time, we don't have a good solution for the old 2G phones that are not the smartphones. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. are still trying to work on that. And I hope that we can crack a solution to keep them safe. However, what we have been working with a lot of the, our enterprise customers is, for example, working on technology to keep to track people's temperatures. So one of the things we've been thinking about is to have people wear a wristband, which ah, can mentioned. actually send the information to your phone. And that phone sends the data to the application that's tracking your temperature over the day. That's number one. Okay. Number okay. two is companies are putting thermal cameras or actually thermal imaging cameras are a little expensive, but you have cheaper temperature cameras as well that does facial recognition and takes the temperature of the person that temperature is recorded onto the app or you can manually enter it into the app. For the folks okay. who have the old 2G phone that don't have, are not smart, what companies are doing are putting the, the thermal camera or the normal temperature camera in one place, but having the people go uh, and get their temperature the, taken yeah, check. Uh, yes. at that camera X number of hours every so many hours and putting that information into the application so that all of us can keep aware when people are not feeling well and very quickly take action to keep people safe. The intention yeah. is really this, is that I think at the end of the day, uh, corporate India really believes in taking the responsibility to ensure the safety of their workers. Uh, yeah. And I think the sooner all of us in our country get the comfort and the confidence 
that we have systems and processes to keep our colleagues, teamwork, and workforce safe, the sooner our economy can get back on track and yeah. things can start yeah. production Absolutely. again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, TP. The next question I have is from Ruby Swani. Uh, will the combined use of AI and IoT create industry leaders? You know, the answer is yes. Um, and here's my belief. Every crisis has a winner. And I think each one of us in our own companies have to decide whether we want to be one of the winners or not. So, yeah. you know, I think a good example was during demonetization, I think uh, Paytm became very well known. Uh, during this crisis, Zoom has become yes. very well known. So, so every true. crisis has a winner. And therefore, all of us as entrepreneurs or business people or executives uh, need to keep thinking about how do we adapt uh, our technology, our companies, our businesses, our products uh, in this crisis or world of disruption and dislocation. These disruptions and dislocations happen once, who knows, every 10 years, every 20 years. Hopefully, this will be a one in 20 year or one in yeah. 100 year event, I hope. Hopefully, 100 but, years, yeah. Exactly. But I hope that this could be an incredible opportunity for some companies to really rethink of the way they do business, rethink about their products. And the companies who don't do that, I think, will fall behind. Gonna, That's just the way things sure. are. Yeah, yeah. That's the way of the world anyways. Crisis or no crisis. True, true. Um, Tejpreet, uh, Arjun Swani wanted to know if there is a demand in Indian industry for labor skilled in AI. Uh, Arjun Swani, by the way, is our President Deepa Swani's son and is currently in Vancouver. And all these questions come to us from Vancouver. Is the demand limited to niche industries like fintech or e-commerce? Or are these applications for sectors like agriculture and manufacturing too? Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, AI, I really believe, uh, is going to become uh, more prevalent and critical going forward. Uh, and why do I say that? I go back to the first point I made. Uh, all in companies around the world are going to try to think about how do we get more productive, productive in terms yeah. of asset productivity, people productivity. So everybody's going to look at getting, becoming more productive. And how are you going to do that? You're going to do that through an increased industrial autom automation, more digitalization, more investments in terms of being able to make a certain product with less people, uh, but yeah. make it more automated. So I think there will be clearly a move towards driving productivity a clear move towards optimization, a clear move in terms of flexible manufacturing, because gone are the days where people are going to rely on one supply chain uh, only from China. I think people are going yeah. to rethink about the way you create, do manufacturing around the world and think about alternative places to do supply chain and maybe even take manufacturing back uh, to their own backyard, whether it's the United States, etc. So I think there will be a change in the way people think about supply chain and manufacturing going forward. To your point on using AI in industry, that's exactly what we've done. We've started out by actually improving the productivity of wind turbines around the world, where we would put our sensors yeah. and gateways into wind turbines, get the data out, and be able to predict failures in a turbine, whether it's a failure in a gearbox, a generator, a bearing, a blade. So that's how we started this journey. But over time, we've started doing that in the auto industry, in the oil and gas industry, in the steel industry? How do we make uh, steel production more, uh, uh, more productive? Uh, how do we make the blast furnace better? How do we make the caster billet better? How do we yeah. make track yeah. assets? Um, you know, the largest railway wagon in the world, uh, lessor in the world, owner in the world, wanted to know at all points in time where the wagon is uh, yeah. and what the maintenance condition of the railway wagon is. So we have this small little gateway that we put under the railway wagon where we're getting all this data. So today we can know where the wagon is, but more importantly, track the maintenance condition of the railway wagon. Uh, we are able to do it for assets on an airport. Uh, we can do it in gas pipelines. We can put our sensors on a gas pipeline and see where the leakages are in the flanges. Uh, so as a result of this, I think IoT is gonna be driven more. We've actually put sensors in the key cranes and RTGSs of, some of, the, of one of the largest ports in India 
We're getting all the data. And now we can predict failures in the crane on a port because once a ship comes to port and if the crane breaks down, the opportunity cost is huge. So as a result of that, we're trying to find ways to actually predict the failures in these, in these cranes to be able to reduce our downtime and improve reliability. We're also doing that with energy efficiency in buildings. What we find is when you look at factories, especially energy intensive factories, uh, aluminum, fertilizer, cement, steel, how do we make all these companies more efficient, energy efficient using AI? And we do that for buildings as well. So we put sensors into the HVACs and the chillers, get the data out and help improve the way energy is consumed in buildings. So I really believe the use cases are huge, industry after industry. And I think AI is going to get becoming more pre prevalent to drive productivity. Tejpreet, there's a question uh, talking about AI, uh, you know, sort of taking over. Uh, just a second, I'm just looking for it. Yeah. Karan Barma would want us, as well as a couple of other people, I'm trying to find their names. But the basic point here is that with the onset of this much automation, it's going to affect our surplus labor that already exists in India. Won't this drive a wedge? Yeah, I think, Praneet, whenever such a dislocation or disruption happens in the world, um, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have to adapt. The workforce will have to adapt. Uh, like I said, uh, the skills that were, were required yesterday are going to be different going forward. So I have a feeling, if you think about it, today uh, are the top largest, 10 largest companies in the world in terms of market cap, about four or five of them are in China. Uh, if you look at the largest banks in the world, three or four of them are in China. Uh, who would have ever thought that we are in a world today where the largest market cap companies in the United States are technology companies, they're not the G's of the world. So it's been an incredible change in the way the world values companies from the industrial way into the digital world. So I think there is a transformation happening and therefore all of us have to change the way we think, change the skill sets our, our, our workforce has yeah, to adapt to yeah. where the future is. So I think uh, digital is going to be more important. Technology is going to be important. And the other thing that's going to happen is that bricks and mortar industry is going to, is going to uh, transform, transform into bringing in the world of technology into bricks and mortar manufacturing to become, to drive productivity going forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, TP, Yuvraj Singh wanted to know when your wrist bag, uh, wristband uh, product is going to be uh, out. Yeah. So like I said, we have two solutions. One is with the US app, where we, we have a little bit of a wristband solution, which where we are sending just temperature. So that's a, just a basic temperature sensor that we get on the app. But the other product, which is what we call the RTLS technology using BLE protocol, that's already ready. We could actually go to any factory today in the world, install the locators. Locators are these big, like little, um, uh, like, a, like a router, like a little mm -hmm. bit of a router, which you put at the roof of your factory uh, or in your office building or something like that. Based on how big it is, you put maybe a few more routers based on how big the factory is. Uh, but the tags are already ready. The wristband with the tags are ready. The ID cards are ready. So we're ready to roll out uh, uh, right now. Brilliant. Um, there is a question, just a second. Uh, okay, we'll come back to that when I can find, yeah. Um, Risha Bagarwal asks, um, all this is data which has to be studied over a very long time. When do you feel this uh, data is reliable? Uh, I'm a little confused as to, you know, which data they're referring to, but nevertheless, um, um, I'll, I'll give it a crack. So I think um, when we do AI for machines, right, when we have to predict uh, a failure in a turbine, a CNC machine, a gas turbine, um, generally what we do is we collect uh, historical data, and this data could be one year or two years old, we collect breakdown data, failure data, you know, maintenance data for about two, three years. We correlate all the historical data with the live data feed coming in. Uh, we have predicted forecasted data. So what is the weather going to be if in a certain industry? Put all, the, all of that to provide uh, certain outcomes and insights. 
<clears throat> so that's what we do in the case of machines. However, with regards to what we're doing right now in the corona world, uh, we don't need all that historical data. So whatever live data we are getting, uh, we are just uh, training all our algorithms with machine learning to learn as fast as possible. And we will keep on uh, providing insights. Unfortunately, there is no historical data that we have to take advantage yeah. of. And yeah. that's just the world we are living in. Um, TP, somebody wanted to know whether the wristband device can be used for children in school or are you looking at a specific device for schools? Is that a... Uh, uh, line that you have explored? You know, I'm very keen that the app can be immediately used in universities, hospitals, schools, because anybody that has a smartphone uh, can use the app. So yes, the answer is yes, it can be used in schools, etc. The wristband solution, which is using the RTLS with the BLE protocol, absolutely can be used. But unfortunately, it is a little expensive. The hardware is a little expensive. And my concern is, I just don't think it's going to be economically viable in the school application. And that's why I said that the benefit of this technology is that once you put in the hardware into a factory or an office space, even in the post-corona world, it can be used uh, for asset productivity, people productivity, a lot of use cases. If you're on a, a card manufacturing yeah. line, if you want to track where your tooling is, your inventory is, or where all your production is, where your forklifts are. Uh, if you're in an airport, if you want to track certain things, so you can do all that. But I just don't yeah. think the economics are going to be viable for a school. However, the, the, the cell phone uh, application is something that we can use in a, in a, in a school environment. Okay. If cell phones yeah. are allowed yeah. in the school. Yeah, most of them now, yes. A lot of them. And especially if it's going to safeguard the children, I don't think the parents would have a problem with. So yes, mm -hmm. that would be a solution. Uh, Tejpreet, um, Rohini wanted to know, AI is all set to be incorporated in fields like medicine, judiciary, law and order, etc. These require a human element of empathy. Um, what do you think of that aspect of AI? Yeah. No, I think it's a very, very good question. And it's a debate that the whole world is having uh, mm -hmm. around this. Uh, I don't claim to have a really good answer, uh, nor do I know what the ultimate solution is. Uh, but I'll just say this. The way we use technology is critical. And the way you put it to use is critical. Uh, I think we as humans have to decide what the box is or what the boundary lines are and ensure yeah. that we're using it for the right purpose to get the right solution and not used incorrectly. I think in our case, we are using it for a very clear use case, which is how do we make machines productive? How do we all become more productive in our factories? How do we drive competitive advantage using technology? Uh, but as long as it's not being used, uh, you know, for the wrong reasons, yeah. you know, for, yeah. the wrong, uh, uh, for the wrong application, I think uh, we as humans need to decide, what, decide where that uh, boundary limit is and ensure we don't cross those boundary limits. TP, we had a very interesting question and I'm trying to find that right now. Uh, it was from somebody in Germany. Yes, it's right here. Uh, th this is from Ashish Mittal, who is the head of product management at N26 Bank in Germany and ex-director of Flipkart. He wanted to know what kind of innovation can be expected from energy and energy distribution industry. Yeah, no, I, it's, a, it's a good question. And I'm trying to think, uh, AI is going to have a huge application in the energy world. Um, and I'll just share with you a few thoughts that come to mind uh, immediately. Uh, the first one is uh, one of the things that we've been looking at and analyzing is we do a lot of work with visual analytics. So can you make computers think uh, like the human brain by looking at things? Um, uh, I'll give you a quick example in the energy world, not exactly in energy distribution, but let me give you another example and we can come back to energy distribution. Uh, you know the transmission distribution lines where you see the big, uh, you see the, the, big, uh, uh, the wires that take uh, electricity yeah. from A to B? 
Um, yeah. Today, when you track TND lines, uh, it's a very manual process. People actually walk uh, many, many, many kilometers every day uh, to check whether the sagging of the line is over a certain amount or not. And they take pictures uh, of that and they upload mm -hmm. it. Uh, and somebody has a look at it. And it's a very manual process that happens. So one of the yeah. things we've, been, we've, been, we've done right now is to train our visual analytics models to take all those pictures coming in to be able to get the computers to see when sagging is taking place, which causes more inefficiency in T and D lines. So that's yeah. an example of how we've taken AI and adapting it to the energy world. The other use okay. case I'll talk to you. We are big transformers. And mm -hmm. what we are now doing is some, we are tracking, monitoring transformers in Europe from our control center in Bangalore to be able to predict failures in wow. transformers in, 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 in yeah. Europe. So that's yeah. what we can do through IoT. We can actually get data from any corner of the world and actually provide our algorithms to be able to predict failures in transformers. So similarly, yeah. even in energy and energy distribution, um, I talked to you about a little bit about the distribution line and transmission lines when you take yeah. power from A to B. We can do it for solar power in a distributed energy scenario. Uh, the applications are huge. Uh, in yeah. the way we can drive, uh, use energy applications to drive it. But Pradeep, let me just share one more point to you. What's really driving this revolution, in my view, are four or five things. One is the cloud. At the end of the day, yeah. it's the same cloud for you, for me, for everybody in the world, whether you go True. to Amazon or True. Azure or Google, it's yeah. the same cloud. Yeah. Two, yeah. the ability to extract data from any corner of the world to any corner of the world has come down, has become very easy and become very cheap. Three, sensor costs have come down very dramatically around the world. The fourth thing is high performance compute, once upon a time, yeah. used to be only with large corporations. Today you sure. have it and everybody on this call has access yeah. to high performance compute. And the yeah. fifth thing we have is in India, we have human capital. We have some of the best minds and brains in India to be able Absolutely. to think through and come up with these, all these algorithms to make a difference in people's lives. So that's what we're trying to do is to see if we can take the power of these five things. And I call it yeah. the democratization of technology that today, because of this, anybody, anybody, anywhere in the world, from a guy in Kanpur to Chennai to Delhi to anywhere yeah. in the world has the power to use the power of AI to transform the way we think, the way we manufacture, the way we yeah. learn. Yeah, yeah, incredible. Tejpreet, it seems that we're out of time. Uh, I have just one last question for you before I leave. Uh, two things. Number one, there are several industry-specific questions, which if you're okay, I will email to you, and we will uh, send the answers back to them. Um, and before we leave, I have one question for you. Your favorite experience slash defining moment at... Uh, the World Economic Forums. You've attended several. So give us your very, very favorite. Yeah. No, I've had the good opportunity, good fortune and good opportunity to attend, uh, you know, Davos for the last eight, nine years. But I'll share a few that I keep in mind. I tell everybody the thing that I remember from all these trips is not listening to a world leader speak about the future or the economy. I don't remember <coughs> what... Um, uh, the world leader said last year or what he said two years ago. But what I do remember are some incredible experiences of speeches or speak or talks by people who've done something different. So I'll share a few of them with you. The first one is, do you remember, uh, uh, his name was Charles Sullenberger. Uh, uh, yes. Was uh, Ch yeah. uh, uh, Chesley Sullenberger, uh, the captain who of who the US landed Aircraft the plane. Had, yeah. Who yeah. landed the plane on the Hudson River. When That's right. He lost, yeah. When he had a, when he had, a, when both his engines lost power. And That's he landed right. The plane. It's a movie now. So it's a movie, it's a movie now, right? Now. Yeah. So he yeah. came and spoke to us just after the incident happened to share with us his leadership lessons. Wow. While he was wow. flying the plane, when the first engine went out, and then a few minutes later the second engine went out, and how he he shared his story about his uh, what went through his mind uh, while yeah. he was landing the plane. So those are the kinds of things I remember. So that's one. The second one is there was, um, if I remember right, his name is Ite Talgam, uh, I-T-A-Y. Okay. 
T A L G A M. Um, if I remember right, he used to be the conductor of the Israeli uh, Philharmonic uh, uh, Orchestra, and he has, in fact, I, I'd encourage everybody go, to go to YouTube and see his video. He came okay. to speak to us to teach us leadership lessons by analyzing the way the best conductors in the world used to conduct their orchestra. How interesting! And How he interesting. studied them over a long period of time to actually uh -huh. see the way they used to conduct, whether how serious they were, did they put the fear of God into the guy playing the violin, or did, was he very nice? So yeah, yeah. did the impact, the music we were hearing, have an impact the way the conductor conducts? So he's the how other person yes. I remember in terms of uh, what happened. And uh, I'd say the third one is uh, just the opportunity to meet people who've actually inspired me and who've actually made a difference in this world. And I think, uh, uh, I think that's been the most incredible opportunity to meet, unexpectedly meet these people who've done some incredible things in their lives. But when you're out there, you're a human. It doesn't matter whether yeah. you, you're the CEO of the largest corporation in the world, whether you're the best musician in the world, or you're the best yeah. movie actor in the world. Out there, we're just people who yeah. come together yeah to share, to learn, uh, and to yeah. really make a difference. So I think those are sort of my yeah. big three takeaways from going to Davos all these years. Thank you so much, Tejpreet. It's been a delight having you with us. And I hope you'll come visit us in Amritsar soon. Wonderful. No, thank you very much for having me on this program. And I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who spent the time actually listening to me. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And for all the viewers, if they want to understand uh, the app that uh, TP is in the midst of creating, it is on our Pulkari page currently. Uh, we'll send you updates uh, if you want. Tejpreet, can you send us something to forward to everybody? Sure. Yeah? As soon as it's Perfect. ready over the next few days, I'll send you some material. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, TP. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everybody, for signing in. Uh, that was wonderful to see so many people enjoying this session. Uh, it's just been, you know, resounding to see so many people here and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.